Welcome to the New Judge One podcast. Uh, we are still on break, so here's another sample episode from our Patreon. This is uh, about the great Buddhist master Tan Chu Fa Shir, who was Liu Hong Jie's Buddhist master. So, a little bit of a departure from our normal subject, but hope you enjoy it. Uh, thanks for listening and take care. Welcome to the Neja Trend Podcast with Isaac and Jess. And so today we're going to f- focus on the 20th century monk known as Tan Shu Fasher. And he was a, a prominent monk um, in northern China at that time. And um, so when you look at the life of Grandmaster Liu Hung Jie, there's a note in the books about how he learned Buddhism at a younger age and became enlightened in the process. And I've always been interested in in the story behind that and so we've talked about it a bunch so let's begin with this quote about master leo hung jay leo became interested in buddhism and its spiritual way of life after meeting the enlightened tian tai sect buddhist master tan shu fasher who invited him to come to his monastery and learn from him leo rejected the monastic life but his master did not require leo to become a monk simply to learn at the monastery Again, Leo proved to be particularly talented, and Tan Shu began to teach him privately. After a relatively short time, Tan Shu recognized that Leo had realized the nature of emptiness, the major objective of Buddhist Mahayana spiritual practice, which in the West is often called enlightenment. After having realized the spiritual tenets of Tiandai Buddhism from Tan Shu Fasher, Leo left for the mountains of Western China. So that's the story that we have about Master Leo's relationship with this famous monk, Tan Shu. So we dug a little deeper and found this book, Heart of Buddha, Heart of China, The Life of Tan Shu, a 20th Century Monk by James Carter, published in 2011. And this book has a a number of selections from Tan Shu's own autobiography, so it tells his life story. And so we decided now would be a good time to dig a little deeper into the life of Tan Shu that uh, Liu Hongjie had learned from later. So one thing that I found interesting is that You know, on our podcast, we've talked a bunch about the history of China in the 20th century, and Tan Shu's life takes place in that exact same time period that we've been talking about. And so his his life shows a reflection of what's going on at that time. So it says here that uh, Tan Shu was born in 1875. He worked as a laborer, minor government official, fortune teller, and pharmacist before leaving his family behind to become a monk and make a career founding Buddhist temples across China. Before his death in 1963, he witnessed and was part of a century of extraordinary change in China. So that time period, 1875 to 1963, is a huge world shattering shift in life. You know, like the he's born in this later stage of the Qing dynasty. And by the time he dies, um, there's been a multiple new governments have been formed and fallen and communism's taken over China by the end. Um, so he, it's really interesting to me that someone's life could cover almost the sort of medieval village lifestyle all the way up until modernity in the early 1960s. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, to me, it's interesting because he's sort of the other side of it, right? Like we've mostly covered the martial artists and, you know, they give their version of it, which is mostly about, you know, how they kicked ass and, you know, took names while they did it. And, uh, it's just interesting to sort of hear a monk's version of that same time period versus a martial artist. You know, mm. this dude wasn't out there getting into, you know, battles with large warlord armies or anything like that. He was just mm. trying to, you know, trying to feed his family and sort of figure out what life was all about, you know. Right. Uh, <laughs> and he's, you know, he's a peaceful, non-combatant monk in the middle of this very tumultuous time period. So, yeah, you're right. It's a, quite different from the martial arts world. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, he still has to figure out how to navigate and keep it all together during this time. And the one part I thought was pretty funny is how at one point he'd uh, the the quote in the book was something like, you know, he was um, confused by Buddhism and rejected by Taoism. So he went back to being a bookkeeper, you know, and it was just kind of this thing of like, oh, man, you know, he tried and like he couldn't right. he couldn't really figure out what the buddhists were all about and the taoist guy was like i don't think you're really ready for this so he was like oh screw it i'll just go back and you know be a bookkeeper and uh, you know and as a former bookkeeper myself just let's th- chill I'll find all it. your dreams are crushed so yeah you like to be a bookkeeper. count numbers for a right living, and that know? was like, that was his first stage and then eventually yeah. he rises from that point to become this very prominent 
um, Buddhist teacher, you know. So it starts off with him born in a small coastal village of Bay Tang in 1875. War was his constant companion. His father died during the Sino-Japanese War of 1894 to 5. Then artillery destroyed his hometown of Beitang during the Boxer Uprising in 1900, forcing him to find a new home. Five years later, the Russo-Japanese War made him a refugee again. Finally, at the age of 42, he left his home without a word to his wife or children to become a Buddhist monk. But war continued to frame his life and work. For the next three decades, Tanshu navigated feuding warlords, Japanese invasion and occupation, and the Chinese Civil War. War drove him from his home one last time in 1949 when the Communist People's Liberation Army chased him to Hong Kong, where he died. So, yeah, like you were saying, like, it's just one thing to the next. Everywhere he goes, war follows him. And yet somehow he's not only survives, but he just sort of continues his life the whole time. Like, it's hard to picture what you would do if you're if each of your homes was destroyed one after another by by military invasions. But, you know, yeah, that's maybe part of what makes him so extraordinary. You know, he found purpose in spreading Buddhism. Right. So. What do you do if you don't have a home? You wander around spreading the thing you love. Why not? Right? I mean, you know, yeah, like, and in the face of you uh, know, the worst conditions possible. Yeah, and it, you know, he, he sounds like he. Uh, it, I mean, the thing about leaving his family, it wasn't that he left them without any word. I mean, as I understand it, it was more that you know, if he told them what he was doing, then they were going to be as vulnerable as he would be where if he just left they could legitimately say we have no idea where he is he's split and, yeah you know, man, and, yeah and so maybe. it it takes them the the responsibility off of them interesting a little bit yeah that for, could be for his uh whereabouts and part of the consideration you know. yeah interesting so one thing the book mentions here that I wanted to just flag is that uh the author who who translated Tanchu's work here that we're reading from um, Tanchu had written the uh, uh, commentary on the Heart Sutra. A Buddhist sutra is a sacred text, usually purporting to record the spoken teachings of the historical Buddha. This brief and very popular text includes the famous construction, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. So that's the one of the core teachings of this Heart Sutra, and we're going to come back to that later. But I just wanted to flag that as one of the things that that got Tanshu's name well known out there was his writing and teaching on this Heart Sutra. Tanshu's calligraphy had rendered the Heart Sutra emptiness is form and formed as emptiness. This emphasized the idea that uh, breaking attachments was one of the essential messages of the Buddha for those seeking enlightenment. Um, so anyways, that's that's at the heart of that there. Uh, yeah, we'll come back to that. We'll look at the book here about a little bit more. We'll just jump jump around and grab a few key tidbits of, of Tanshu's life. Um, Tanshu's family, originally surnamed Zhang, was religious, patronizing the half dozen temples in and around Beitong village. In typical fashion, these temples, most nominally Buddhist, blended traditions, honoring the local deities, Taoist gods, and a variety of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Bodhisattvas are benevolent beings who, on the cusp of achieving enlightenment, eschew nirvana and return to the normal condition so that they can aid other beings in their quest for enlightenment. Um, it says here that the Dragon King Temple offered protection from the fickle weather that jeopardized both the region's modest agriculture and the safe return of loved ones at sea. So, you know, religion in China at this time is each temple could have multiple Buddhist gods, Taoist gods, uh, local deities, you know, that only occur around that area. So it's, it's a little different than how we think of as like a Christian church or a Jewish temple that's, that's dedicated very specifically to the only this one group. It says here, there was also a temple to Guan Di, the deification of Guan Yu, a general during the wars that followed the dissolution of China's first unified empire in 2020 CE. Both Taoists and Buddhists came to worship Guan Di as the protector of those who were righteous and loyal to their brotherhood with the ironic result that he was worshipped by both the police and by the organized crime. Guan Yu lived hundreds of years before Buddhism became prominent in China, but he converted posthumously to the Buddhist teaching. Um, so Guan Di is somebody we see a lot in the martial arts world. He's often, you know, on an altar at a martial arts school or, I mean, he's everywhere. He's in the restaurants and laundromats and everywhere, but but martial artists especially like him. He's always pictured with the mighty Guan Dao as a, uh, Right. You know, Halberd, and he's on the cover of the Neja Twin book. 
That's right. <laughs> you know, as I understand it, he did do a lot of sort of cross study between Taoism and Buddhism. And uh, I think the Heart Sutra is one of those texts that, you know, it's a Buddhist text, but that concept is a big part of Taoism too. So I think this is where they can use it as a bridge to kind of connect the two a lot of times. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Tanshu insisted that from birth, he was singled out as having a special fate destined to become a Buddhist master. He was slow to speak as a child. And when he did utter his first words, they were not mama or papa, but chizai to keep strict vegetarian diet prescribed by Buddhism. <laughs> Two, then three years went by, and still the boy said only, keep vegetarian, over and over. <laughs> Frustrated and concerned, his mother took him to a neighborhood woman with a reputation for wisdom. The woman declared that the child had taken Buddhist precepts in an earlier life and was attempting to keep them in this one. Um, so then it goes on to explain how hard it was to feed a child on a vegetarian diet in the middle of these war-torn conditions and, uh, you know, just how everything about his life was just off to a bad start, basically. Um, but he did survive his childhood. Um, he grew up with very little schooling in this, in this rural village. Um, so he went through a lot of different experiences. Uh, there's a moment in his life that stands out as a big, as a big moment of uh, shock to him is when his, his friend, his same age, dies right, at, right in the day after his wedding, when they're uh, late teens. After I saw him for the last time at the funeral, my heart was as if stabbed. I returned to my home so grief-stricken I could barely stand it. I thought people suffer because they never know what, the, what moment they may die. My classmate had been only two years older than me, with a new wife and good circumstances. Why had death come so quickly to him? Was there nothing we could do to protect ourselves from illness? Once we became sick, was there nothing we could do to stave off death? These thoughts dominated my mind. So the death of his friend really started him on his religious quest of wondering, what is death? Why is this happening? How, you know, is this inevitable for all of us? Well, you know what they say about trauma kind of sometimes it spurns people to do some interesting things. And, you know, it sounds like he definitely had plenty of early childhood trauma to work no, off of, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess that question is we all ask that question, but for someone who's being bombarded by artillery on a regular basis you probably think of it even more so well and how young he was to really you know i mean that that's i mean i think the the thing about you know vegetarianism might be a little bit of an exaggeration or whatever but definitely shows that from a very early age his focus was on the spiritual quest you know big I, questions of life I, yeah I, and I think, you know, Leo Hung Jae was kind of like that, too. I mean, Maybe, you, know, yeah. you know, he started doing meditation at a really young age, too. I think he was in his 30s when he met Tanshu. So that's sort of what they had, you know, maybe where they had something in common was in addition to being into martial arts, Leo had this interest in meditation. And yeah, it's, it's, and, and, uh, and Tanshu had this sort of ability, I think, to cross-reference Taoism and Buddhism in a way that may have made it mm. easy you know made it easier for a guy who'd spent you know 20 years doing Taoism to cross over and you know the way bruce always described it was that because of his experience in Taoism, that's why he didn't have to go to the monastery and that's why tanshi was able to teach him in such a short period of time he didn't have to become an actual monk he could right, just right. learn he could, straight yeah, up I mean, he, he may have gone yeah he may have gone to the monastery layman, just, yeah. but, but he wasn't you know he wasn't required to take any vows or anything the next thing that tanshi goes through is a near death experience he's he contracts a deadly illness and is in a coma um he describes his journey to the 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 underworld where he's on the verge of death Everything looked muddled and unclear as if in a dream. Two ghosts appeared and took me flying across mountains and ponds and lakes, landing at the entrance of a courtyard, what appeared to be a bureaucrat's official office. Inside the gates were many buildings. The two ghosts brought me to one of these buildings and told me to go in. I obeyed and suddenly a fiendish face appeared before me, angrily shouting for me to wait here. At this point, I realized that I had died and had come to the underworld. I was heartbroken. I thought of my mother's words, her constant worrying that I had not been well nourished and cared for. She would blame herself for my death. I thought to myself that death was not so important to me. It was inevitable and the natural stage that we all must endure, but my mother had only one child left, me. If I were dead, she would cry herself to death. What could be done? So he gets in a big argument with the officials in the underworld and he basically talks them out of keeping him. 
um, with the promise that when he goes back, uh, they're going to give him an extra 10 years or something like that. And he has to, you know, do, do good deeds and, and uh, follow the sutras and stuff if he wants okay. to go back. So the king of hell uh, lets him back. So um, he made a deal with the devil. Basically. He's the, the Robert Johnson uh, of Buddhism. So somehow he talks himself, talks him out of this. And as long as he promises, uh, if you let me return every day, I will chant 10 chapters of the Diamond Sutra. The king of hell heard my words and agreed to let me return. So uh, somehow he came staggering back to life, but now he's committed to a path of Buddhism. Um, so he he's but he doesn't have much education. So he's trying to learn this stuff. And um, and it also the Diamond Sutra is incredibly difficult and challenging to learn. So he he's told that he could substitute it for the much shorter diamond incantation. So he could read this more easily and soon memorized it, chanting it whenever he could. But he also explored the full range of religions open to him, including Buddhism, Taoism, Chinese folk religion, and even Protestant and Roman Catholic Christianity. Because uh, Chinese missionaries had been in, were common in the Tianjin region uh, for many years by that time. So he's exposed, you know, he's, he's living in, near Tianjin, which is a very cosmopolitan place. So he's exposed to a variety of even Western religions as well. Um, it's remarkable that he sought out Christian churches as part of his religious quest. There's no record of a Christian church in Nunha County prior to 1900, but there were several in Tianjin, and missionaries would have regularly traveled through Tangu, just a few miles from Beitong Village. So Tanshu considered taking up Catholicism, Protestant Christianity, Taoism, or Buddhism. His home became a source of amusement and puzzlement for his friends. Statues of Christian saints, Taoist immortals, folk deities, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and icons from every religious tradition he could find were in evidence as he sought a way to avoid re-encountering death. So it's, he goes on this religious quest, and, and it's interesting that he, he he investigated so many different types. You know, that's pretty cool. It's it seems unusual for someone in the early 1900s to be so open minded about different religions. It definitely would have contributed to him being able to convert people and mm. to communicate with people he wasn't True. familiar with. You know, so I think it, it laid a good uh, groundwork for his later sort of. Uh, missionary work as it were so at this point he's not interested in the afterlife he's trying to delay death as long as possible if not preventing it altogether his mind is preoccupied with death and he filled his spare moments with the study of the occult with immortality as his goal he turned to Taoist alchemy at age 19 he sought out a local Taoist master in the village for instruction Chinese alchemists focus almost exclusively on gaining eternal life by the fourth century BE hope BC Hopes for immortality focused on drugs and elixirs and books to aid their preparation spread accordingly. But by, when, but by Tanshu's time, there were hundreds of manuals offering alchemical instruction, usually preserved in Taoist texts. Uh, so he's, he's going to start researching potions and alchemical mixtures to try and escape death. But uh, he, he doesn't find those satisfying. And eventually his teacher is like, yeah, you, you don't need to keep going with this. You know, this isn't working. And he's like, look, I just need a regular job, but I'm going to take a, you know, get back, just try to get some money. So he maintained his interest in the occult, even as he struggled to support his family. A practitioner of occult arts, astrology, prophecy, and medicine persuaded him that medicine and astrology could be useful skills, always needed and requiring nothing more than a room in which to practice. This idea was doubly attractive to Tanshu. Medicine and alchemy could provide income that was stable and portable and also enable him to continue his research into spirituality and occult. He just, the guy he was studying with says, you seem intent on studying, but I do not know if it is right or not. I do not know if the elixirs will succeed or not. This seems to be a case of blind leading the blind, perhaps leading you to jump in the river. Wait until if I wait until I see if my elixir will work and then I will find you again. So that's where we reach the point confused by Buddhism and rejected by Taoism. <laughs> he continued to work as an accountant. <laughs> um, and all this is taking place before <laughs> the Boxer Rebellion. You know, this is all before 1900. So now we come up to 1900, the time of the Boxer Rebellion. And this is interesting because here's a spiritual person. Another war breaks out. And this is where martial arts and this is where Chinese martial arts often intersect with history because this is the Boxer Rebellion. This is martial right. arts involved in a war. So it's it's always a big moment in us for us martial arts people. Um, and the book here has a nice breakdown of a little bit of the story of the Boxer Rebellion, which we've talked about on other podcasts. 
Mm-hmm. It says that boxers is a collective term for a peasant movement against foreign and Christian influences that rose up in northeastern China at the very end of the 19th century. The boxers blamed foreigners for the ills affecting their home provinces, including famine, drought, economic depression, and crop failure. The foreigners' religion, many boxers believed, interfered with the proper order of things and disrupted the rainfall and other natural processes that sustained life. The boxers received their name not just from martial arts, but from movements they performed under the influence of spirit possession. In these rituals, the boxers called on heroes of popular literature, theater, and opera to possess their bodies. This included traditional deities who were worshipped in temples, such as Guan Di, as well as fictional characters, such as the Monkey King or Pigsy from Journey to the West. While thus possessed, the boxers were said to gain supernatural powers, including flight, invisibility, and imperviousness to bullets. These powers would enable them to defeat the evil influences of the foreigners. And here he gives a popular boxer hymn that gives the idea of the mission. I'll read it. Foreigners proselyze their sect. They believe in only one God. The spirits and their ancestors are not even given a nod. No rain has come from heaven. The earth is, or the earth is parched and dry. And all because the churches have bottled up the sky. The gods are very angry. The spirits seek revenge. And mass, they come from heaven to teach the way to men. Spirits emerge from the grottos. Gods come down from the hills, possessing the bodies of men, transmitting their boxing skills. When their magical, when their martial and magic techniques are learned by each one of you, suppressing the foreign devils will not be a hard thing to do. So that's a pretty nice little poem that breaks down the mentality of the Boxer Rebellion. Um, and it says here that he was recruited, but his own study of the cult and the boxer's violent anti-foreignism repulsed him. He said that he found their intolerance unacceptable. Like most Chinese, Tan Chu navigated easily among Buddhist, Taoist, and other religious traditions without insisting rigidly on any one faith or its practices. So the anti-foreigner and anti-religion vibe of the boxers didn't work for him, and he felt that their ideology made no sense, so he didn't join in the boxer rebellion. Yeah, I think a lot of people, I mean, from both sides, both on the religious side and the martial arts side, sort of saw the boxers as exploiting these Mm. ideas, right? Like that, you know, it's a bit the way, you know, people call themselves patriots, you know, like that doesn't necessarily mean you're patriotic. It just means you're using that term, you know, like, so uh, they were able to kind of co-op these ideas of, of, you know, boxers. But I mean, like a lot of these guys have never trained, you know, they, right. You know, they, they get sort of tapped on the shoulder with a little incantation and you know that's supposed to stop a bullet and pretty soon they find right. out as and a lot of it was recruiting villagers mm-hmm. and sort of you know yeah. uneducated people to follow along so that mm-hmm. the the big time martial arts people weren't that into it and neither were the religious people so it's kind of the right I mean, village uprising you know? there were one or two famous martial artists who got involved and that's why you hear about them usually is because they were one of very few that actually got involved most martial artists were smart enough to be like i don't want to get involved in anything that's tying martial arts to religion you know or to a rebellion rebellion right and and uh, or a religious rebellion you know it's like these are not things you necessarily want to you don't want to stick your head up like that get it chopped off so that's something of you know his early life and his early exploration of religion He's decided he's going to start his career as a fortune teller and an apothecary. Um, During his spiritual search, he had studied both astrology and alchemy with a Taoist master. And although he ultimately rejected Taoist claims of immortality, he was now in a position to hang out his shingle as a fortune teller. Originally, when I had studied the occult sciences, it had not seemed like a legitimate use of my time, but now it was useful. Every day, people asked me what their future held, whether they would be able to find food because of the war. They had lost their jobs, and many of them had these kinds of questions. I gave each of them a prophecy and a plan to move forward. Most of the time, they worked, and so business was not bad. It was enough to support myself. He set up shop on the sidewalk, as fortune tellers throughout China had for centuries. The sidewalks of late imperial Chinese cities could, would, could be frenzied bazaars, thronged with fortune tellers, barbers, storytellers, merchants, matchmakers, and old men playing chess, tending cage songbirds, or fighting crickets. On these busy streets, clients sought him out to determine auspicious days for important events and to assess their prospects for personal and professional success. Fortune tellers use several methods. Some emphasize physiognomy, reading a client's fate in palms, facial features, and body type. 
He favored astrological methods, plotting the year, month, date, and sometime hour of a client's birth on a series of axes to produce a spiderweb design indicating the influence of stars, planets, and the moon. Employment, health, marriage, children, wealth, happiness, and longevity were just some of the topics that a reading would address. So that's pretty interesting stuff. Like he's a sidewalk fortune teller. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, yeah. it sounds like he's more like a therapist, maybe, you know, he's kind of like just helping you figure out what to do oh. with your life in the middle of a war. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's kind of what a fortune teller was at that time was, you know, there's sort of a folk religion aspect to it of people being desperate and just wanting anyone, anything to make them feel like it's going to be okay right so the it's the telephone psychic of the day right like right totally psychic know, hotline when people you know when people are desperate they want someone to get them answers. answers and exactly. you know, there's a guy on the street corner telling you he got the answers you you know might as well try it out so after a while uh, of doing this, in addition to paying the bills, his fortune telling practice enabled him to continue his quest for religious fulfillment. Astrology blended Buddhism, Taoism, and other folk religions until they were all but indistinguishable. He began attending lectures regularly at a local institution known as the Lecture Hall. This organization presented a broad range of Chinese religious experience in keeping with his eclectic interests, Confucian texts, Taoist elixirs, Buddhist sutras, seances, and charitable campaigns were all at home there. He spent much time as, he, as much time as he could at the lecture hall, studying and listening. Eventually, he himself was asked to speak on important topics. Um, he had been called on a spiritual journey since birth, but determining the right path repeatedly frustrated him. He had studied Taoism, Buddhism, even Christianity, but was unsure at every turn whether he was following his true calling. And he, at the lecture hall, he explored all of these traditions, but increasingly found himself focused on Buddhism. Um, and so at this time, it's saying that there's a sort of a Buddhist revival was starting to grow during this time. A Buddhist lay people and clergy were starting to grow. And he starts to find himself caught up in the movement and, and more and more identifying with Buddhist ideas. Um, he says, although he felt that all the religious traditions being practiced and studied at the lecture hall were worthy, they all promoted good over evil and encouraged adherents to cultivate their minds and souls. Buddhism's attitude to reality and to suffering attracted him. The first text he approached, the Surangama, Diamond, and Lotus Sutras, all emphasize that in this world and the suffering in it is but an illusion, distracting our minds from the true nature of the universe and the work that we must do to attain enlightenment. For him, the chance to believe that there was more to this world than the war and disease that had framed his own life for 20 years was very appealing. Well, I mean, there's a whole thing, you know, like in religious studies, as you know, uh, about how religions that emphasize the afterlife generally tend to be popular with people whose lives aren't that great because if your life is kind of shitty the idea that the next life is going to be better is kind of appealing you know it, it, there's a certain piece of you know that in christianity there's a yeah. piece of that in buddhism where it's like you know the meek shall, shall inherit the earth right that mm. in, in this life it might be kind of rough but if you're a good buddhist and you do your work and you you know you, you stick to the sutras then you can you know get a better shot next time around so right. you know i mean that's what religion does. It gives people hope. It gives people something to kind of go Keep back going. to. to go <laughs> back. Well, to go back to. I mean, that's what the word means is uh, the thing to which you return, you know. So it's like religion is the thing you go back to when you're freaking out. And well, like you and I, I think, aren't really religious, but we're martial artists, you know. So when we get freaked out, you know, we go walk circle or we go do Qigong or we mm. meditate. It's like that's our religion not i mean at least uh, you know i don't put it you know like i'm not a buddhist or a taoist like i i practice taoist things but like i'm not i don't have you know not official <laughs> yeah i mean i like i do it in my own way but mostly what i'm doing is i'm practicing a secular version of the movements and martial arts that were attached to taoism you know and i think there's a real difference between that and you know, going full bore into the the alchemy and the, mm. you know, the spiritual side of it. It's like a little bit of spiritual balance in your life is one thing, but like devoting your entire life to it is a, you know, quite that's, another, that's another. <laughs>